Hello everyone, this is Suzanne at the Gospel Truth, formerly known as God Crochet on Chatter. I'm not doing much crocheting lately or working with my knitting machine due to surgery um, issues, or shoulder issues. Uh, my pain level rises quite a bit when I attempt to do that, so I'm just backing off of that for now. But I still love crocheting and knitting and all that. And someday I'll get back to it. Not anytime soon, because this shoulder surgery is going to take quite a while to heal. But everything has its season. Everything has its time, correct? Oh, yeah. All right. We are making headway in our book. We are reading Tramp for the Lord, The Life of Corey Ten Boom. We, we read the book of her when she was in the prison camp. Uh, during the reign of uh, Hitler and how she survived all that and how God put her on a mission to tramp for the Lord. She has gone all over the world spreading the message of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to cover 26 through 30 or 31. They're each only a couple of pages. So we're going to try to finish this book up perhaps tomorrow or for sure by Monday. And some of you have expressed interest in this book, In My Father's House, How She Grew Up, What She Was Taught, More About Her Brothers and Her Sisters. This will be fabulous. I am very interested to, to hear about this father and mother raising these kids and teaching them about Jesus Christ and the Bible daily. All right, let's get started. Walking in the Light, Chapter 26. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Our last few weeks in Luza proved to be the most fruitful of our entire time spent there, for it was in these weeks that I learned another valuable lesson. The Lesson of Walking in the Light We as Christians must learn lessons throughout our Christian walk. Valuable lessons that will strengthen our faith, raise our courage, and we will build our trust daily more and more. And though that is very important to learn those valuable lessons. One afternoon, Connie and I were sitting in the garden looking at monkeys jumping from one tree to another. The trees and scrubs were a mass of color and sound, causing my heart to be filled with the glory of God's grace. Yet, Connie was discouraged. She had started a girls club in the YWCA in Kampala and had spent many hours work with it. However, the girls were not interested. I was concerned about her discouragement, feeling it went far deeper than the problem she was having with her class. I started to ask her about it when we were interrupted by a man walking toward our hill. Connie squinted her eyes into the sun and then shouted, It is William Magenda! What a joy to meet that dear African state again! I never met an African with whom I could laugh so much and yet learned so much at the same time. After we exchanged greetings, William said, When I saw you sitting here together, a question came to my mind. Do they walk in the light together? We answered almost simultaneously, Oh, yes, we do walk in the light together. We're a team. Just at that moment, a boy from the house called that there was a telephone message for me. I excused myself while Connie and William remained behind to talk. Connie was sitting in a cane and wicker chair while William squatted on his haunches beside the path, his brown knees poking up beside his face. I have something to confess to you, Connie said to William. And what is that? He answered gently. Your question gripped my heart. I must tell you that I do not really walk in the light with Tandy Corey. William's face broke into a wide grin, and then his eyes began to sparkle. So that is why God had me ask that strange question. Connie was serious. 
Candy Corey is so much more mature than I, she continued. She has walked with Jesus for so many years. She has suffered much for him in many ways. Thus, when I see things in her life that are not right, I hesitate to speak them out to her. Oh, William said, startled, that is not right. The Lord wants you to be very honest with Tandy Corey. That is one reason he has put you with her. Since she is walking in the light, then when you also walk in the light, you will help shed light for her path as well as yours. That night, after we'd gone to our room together, Connie sat on the right side of the bed and said, Tandy Corey, this is very difficult for me to say, but I now realize I must walk in the light. I turned and looked at her. Her face was drawn and solemn. One by one, she began listing things in my life which bothered her, the things I did which she did not believe glorified God. It was not easy for me to hear the things which I had done wrong, things which had caused a shadow to come in Connie's heart. But how wonderful it was that Connie was being completely honest with me. I apologized for the things she had listed and then thanked her for bringing them into the light. Let us always walk in the light together, I said seriously. But it was still hard for Connie. She was much younger than I and felt she was still learning. Even though I wanted her to continue to correct me, she found it very difficult. The final breakthrough came after we left Africa and flew to Brazil. Isn't that true? You know, if you find something that needs correction in me, to help me bring bring myself more to the light and line up more in God's word, please private message me, make a comment. And we all need the opportunity to clean up our act. And sometimes we don't realize those areas that need to be cleaned up. And we need someone to pull us aside and say, hey, and always do it with love and have confidence that the person you're going to tell it to will take it in the correct way. And even if they don't take it in the correct way, sometimes things just need to be said to clear the air and get back on track. And we all want to be on the right track for Jesus. We had been in Rio de Janeiro, one of the most beautiful cities of the world for a few weeks. As we prepared to leave, to fly south to Buenos Aires, we discovered our suitcases were overweight. The people in Rio had given us so many presents, we were more than 20 kilograms overweight. It was going to cost us a great deal of extra money to go on to Argentina. I unpacked my luggage and made three piles, one to send to Holland by sea, one to give away to the poor in Rio, and the smallest one to go back in my suitcase to carry on to our next destination. Finished my repacking. I hurried next door in Connie's room and unpacked her suitcase also. I went through the same procedure, sort her belongings into three heaps, and then repacking only her necessary items. I was in too much of a hurry to notice that Connie said nothing. A week later, after a beautiful time in Buenos Aires, we were walking along a lonely stretch of beach near our, beach near our cabin. I was enjoying the beautiful view over a quiet bay when Connie began to talk. Her voice was strained. I promised God I would walk in the light, she said, and that means that I must get something settled with you. When you repacked my suitcase and decided what things to send to Holland and what to leave with me, I was not happy about it. How stupid and tactless I had been to rush in and interfere in Connie's life. I reached out and took her hand. How thoughtless I have been, I said. Forgive me for not leaving it up to you. I think Corey is the kind of get to it woman and can take over things very quickly, not meaning any harm. I think that's her personality. And sometimes we need to let people do what they need to do and we need not step in and interfere. I do forgive you, Connie said. Like myself, she had learned not to play lightly with sin, but to hear another's apology, and then instead of passing it off to, forg to forgive it, we walked for a long time in silence, then Connie spoke again. Are you unhappy, Tandy Corey? You are so quiet. 
Now it was my time to walk in the light. There is something hindering me, I said. Why did you not tell me immediately that you were disturbed? That way it could have been settled on the spot, and you would not have had to carry this darkness all these days. From now on, let us both speak the truth in love, and never let the sun go down on our misunderstandings. It was a good lesson. From then on, Connie married in 1967 and went to live with her husband. We walked all over the world, always trying to walk in light. Chapter 27, Secure in Jesus. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Secure in Jesus. It is Satan who tries in every way to spoil the peace and joy of God's servants having their work. That is absolutely the truth there. Alan, my new traveling companion, had gone with me to a lovely mission field in Mexico. Our hostess was a lady missionary, unmarried and in her 40s. One evening, while we were alone in her little abode, she confessed her bitterness and resentment over being unmarried. Why have I been denied the love of a husband, children, and a home? Why is it that the only men who ever paid any attention to me were married to someone else? Long into the night, she poured out the poison of her frustration. At last, she asked me, Why did you never marry? Because, I said, the Lord had other plans for me than married, than a married life. Did you ever fall in love and lose someone as I have? She asked bitterly. We know the answer to that, don't we? Yes, I said sadly. I know the pain of a broken heart. But you were strong, weren't you? She said in biting tones. You were willing to let God have his way in your life. Oh, no, not at first, I said. I had to fight a battle over it. I was 23. I loved a boy and believed he loved me. But I had no money and he married a rich girl. After they were married, he brought her to me and putting her hand in mine said, I hope you two will be friends. I wanted to scream. She looked so sweet, so secure and content in his love. But I did have Jesus and eventually I went to him and prayed. Lord Jesus, you know I belong to you 100%. My sex life is yours also. I don't know what plans you have for my life, but Lord, whatever it may be, use me to realize your victory in every detail. I hope you can take away all my frustrations and feelings of unhappiness. I surrender anew my whole life to you. I looked across the little table at the bitter woman in front of me. Her face was furrowed, her eyes hard with resentment. I sensed she had been trying to run away from her frustrations. Perhaps that was even the reason she was on, in the mission field. Sadly, there are some of God's children who will go to the mission field to escape the pain of not having a husband. I know others back home who spend every evening away from their families, attending Christian meetings because they are unhappy and frustrated in their marriages. Work, even mission work, can become a wrong hiding place. But you loved and lost, she exclaimed. Do you believe that God took away your lover to make you follow him? Oh, no, I smiled. God does not take away from us. He might ask us to turn our backs on something or someone we should not have. We should not have. God never takes away, however God gives. If I reach out and take someone for myself and the Lord steps in between, that does not mean God takes. Rather, it means he is protecting us from someone we should not have because he has a far greater purpose for our lives. We sat for long minutes in the semi-dark room. Only a small kerosene lamp gave its flickering light, casting faint shadows on the walks and across our faces. I thought back, remembering. I had always been content in the Lord. Back when I was in my 30s, God gave me children, the children of missionaries whom I raised. Betsy, my sister, fed and clothed them while I was responsible for their sports and music. We kept them in our home in Holland, and I found a deep satisfaction in seeing them grow to maturity. I also spent a great deal of time speaking and sharing in various clubs for girls. But it was not the work that brought balance to my life, for work cannot balance our feelings. It was because my life was centered in the Lord Jesus that I had balance. 
We all need to be centered in Jesus so we have balance. Many people try to lose their feelings in work, sports, or music, or the arts. But the feelings are always there and will eventually, as they had done tonight in this missionary, come boiling to the surface and express their resentment and discontent. I turn to Ellen, my companion. Ellen is a tall, blonde, beautiful Dutch girl in her early 30s. She is single, yet she has learned the secret of living a balanced life. While I believe God set me apart before I was born to live a single life, Ellen was different. She did not feel that God had called her to a single life. Rather, she felt that one day, in God's time, she would marry. However, until that time arrived, one year or 30 years from then, I knew she was secure in Jesus and was not looking to a, looking to a husband or children for her security. I spoke to the missionary. There are some, like me, who are called to a single life, I said softly. For them, it is always easy, for they are, by their nature, content. Others, like Ellen, are called to prepare for marriage, which may come later in life. They, too, are blessed, for God is using them in the in-between years to reach them that marriage is not the answer to unhappiness. Happiness is found only in a balanced relationship with Jesus Christ. I like that, the in-between years. There will be those in-between years, and we have to wait patiently on the Lord and not be sad over what we don't have now and trust in the Lord's leading that he will provide us with what we need at the right time. But it is so hard, she said, tears welling up in her eyes. That is so, I said. The cross is always difficult. But you are but you are dead and your life is hid with Christ. Dear girl, it cannot be safer. That part of you which would cling to a husband is dead. Now you can move into a life where you can be happy with or without a husband, secure in Jesus alone. I do not know if she really understood me. For often we set our minds on some things. For often we set our minds on some one thing we think will make us happy: a husband, children, a particular job, or even a ministry, and refuse to open our eyes to God's better way. In fact, some believe so strongly that only this thing can bring happiness, that they reject the Lord Jesus Himself. Happiness is not found in marriage or work or ministry or children. Happiness is found by being secure in Jesus. That is so true. So true. Okay. Chapter 28, and then we're going to leave off there. Chapters were a little bit longer than what I thought, but that's okay. Chapter 28, I have much people in this city. After these things, the Lord appointed another seventy also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place. Every city and every place, two by two. My second trip to Cuba was much different from the earlier one, because this time Cuba was in the hands of communists. Ellen was with me, and we'd come from Mexico with our bags loaded with books. Friends had told us that the communists in Cuba were burning Bibles and confiscating Christian literature. Oh, that just burning Bibles. Can you imagine? So I was not at all sure if we would be allowed to bring all these books with us. We had also heard that most of the churches were closed and many of the Christians were in prison, some of them for passing out literature. Thus, we were very cautious. At customs in Havana, the officer pointed to my suitcases. What are these books? he asked. They are written by me, I said. I'm going to give them to my friends. I saw him scowl as he picked up one of them. My heart began to beat rapidly. Oh, Lord, I prayed inwardly. What must I do? Then I heard myself saying brashly, Would you like to have one of my books? Here, I will autograph it especially for you. The customs officer looked up. I took the book from his hand and wrote my name in the front and then handed it back. He grinned broadly and thanked me. Then glancing once more at my suitcase filled with books, he nodded and motioned us through the line. I closed the suitcase and stepped out onto the streets. 
Hallelujah, the miracle had happened. But why were we here? What kind of plans did the Lord have for us on this island? Had all our former friends been put in prison? Were any of the churches still open? These and many other questions pounded at my mind as we turned our faces toward the city. An in-tourist limousine brought us into the heart of Havana, where we, where we found a, ho a hotel room. After washing up, we went onto the streets, hoping to find some Christians. How do you find Christians in a strange city when you cannot even speak their language? We walked up and down the sidewalks, hoping God would show us someone to speak to, but we received no guidance whatsoever. I finally approached an old man who was leaning against the side of a building. He had a kindly face, I thought. I asked if he knew where there was a church. He shrugged his shoulders, but then, motioning us to wait, went to one of the three telephones along the street. Ellen and I stood praying. Was he going to call the police? Had we broken a law? And would we be put in jail? Then we realized he was calling some of his friends, asking if they knew the whereabouts of a church. No one knew anything, and he returned, saying he could be of no help. We were discouraged, and to make matters worse, it started to rain. Neither Ellen or I had a raincoat, and soon we were soaked to the skin. We had been walking for hours, and I was exhausted. Ellen, can we try to get a taxi, I asked. Well, Candy Corey, we will need a miracle. However, we know that all things are possible with God. So often, Connie and her helpers, Ellen and Connie and all of them, they bring up scriptures at the most appropriate times. However, we know that all things are possible with God. If we can incorporate that into our Christian walk, our Christian life, get to know the scriptures so that we can bring them back to our remembrance, and that will give us the faith and courage to trudge on through life, that is, that is awesome. I found a little stool and sat down while Ellen walked on down the street, hoping to find a taxi. I looked out over the sea and felt as if I had just waded out of the surf, so wet was I. I thought of the words of the driver of the insurer's limousine as he had brought us up from the airport. This is the hospital, he had said as we drove by. Everyone who is ill can go there, and it does not cost a penny. Here is a cemetery. When you die, we bury you, and, that even, and even that doesn't cost your relatives anything. I have been in many countries, but this was the first place they had offered to bury me. <laughs> we knew that the Lord had sent us to Cuba but we had no idea of our mission. Where were the churches? We had seen some, but they were closed. Some even had trees growing in front of the doors. We had tried to call some Christians, but the ones we knew were no longer living in the area. I sat, waiting, while the water poured down my face. Then I heard a car stopping in front of me. Looking up, I saw Ellen's face in the rear window of the ancient rented vehicle. Tandy Corey, she called above the sound of the rain. Here I am again. I hobbled to the taxi and got in the back door. Be careful where you put your feet, Ellen laughed, or you will touch the street. The taxi took us to our hotel, and soon we were in dry clothes. Our wet garments hung across the fixtures in the bathroom, where the steady drip, drip of water reminded us of our barrier on the street. I love to walk with Jesus. But after eight decades, I realized I was not as young as I used to be. It was in such moments that I started to feel old. I can imagine 80 years old, lugging suitcases, going up flights of stairs, all those things. Very hard on Tandy. But she was very adamant to follow where the Lord was sending her and what he wanted her to teach. Even though she didn't understand, maybe right away when she was there, soon it was revealed to her. And we need to be patient and wait. Things will be revealed to us on what we need to do and where the Lord is sending us. And we soon learn why he wanted us there. And then that is the most spectacular moment of all. Like, oh, all right. All those light bulbs go out and joy comes. Ellen could not sleep that night. We were supposed to stay in Cuba for two weeks, but we could not find any Christians. Then what would we do? 
She arose in the middle of the night and prayed, Lord, give me a word so I may know we aren't in this country in vain. Sitting on the side of her bed, she reached for her Bible, which was on the small table. She began to read where she had stopped the night before. She had learned that God does not want his children to be fearful, and the best way to overcome fear is through the word of God. She read Acts 18, 9, and 10. Then spoke the Lord to Paul, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. What an answer! The next morning, Ellen could not wait to find all those people, and neither could I. She had one address, which we had not contracted. It was the address of a small house on a side street where some Christians we had once known used to live. Walking from the hotel, we finally found the street and made our way to a dingy drawer, weather-beaten and cracked. She knocked boldly. A small man, deeply tanned and with wrinkles around his eyes, cautiously opened the door. Ellen could speak no Spanish, but she held up her Bible and one of my books, Amazing Love, which had been translated into Spanish. The man glanced at the books, then back at Ellen. Ellen smiled and pointed to my name on the book, then pointed back toward the city. Suddenly, his whole face came alive. He threw open the door and shouted, Corey! Corey Tin Boom! Ellen walked in and found the room filled with men, all kneeling on the floor. There were pastors who met each week to pray for God's help and guidance in their difficult ministry. Ellen hurried back to the hotel, and soon I was meeting with these wonderful men of God. We distributed all of our books and many made many new friends among God's people. Indeed, God did have much people in that city. Oh, isn't that wonderful? You know, Corey goes someplace and her helper, and when they finally reach that destination... And they finally realized, this is why, this is why we were sent here. Through all the rain, all the muck, you know, everything we've had to endure. Wow. You know, it was worth it. And most times in life, that's the way it is with Christians. Once we reach our destination, once we know, it's such, uh, such a joy in our hearts that occurs. And I've been thinking and a lot since I started reading about Corey. And, you know, I've been wondering, you know, okay, Lord, why me? Why why did I have to have knee surgery? And why do I have to have another knee surgery, possibly? Now I'm facing shoulder surgery. It hurts really bad, and at times it just won't stop. And I have to be on all these pain meds, which I don't like being on. I'm not able to do the things I really want to do. Because if I do that, I'm going to suffer. And I've not yet seen God's purpose. I know when I do see God's purpose in all of this, the light bulbs are going to go off. I'm going to thank the Lord for allowing me to carry my cross and to get through it all. And know that God is with me every step of the way. So any of us that are dealing with chronic pain issues or many surgeries, um, we have to know this comes from Satan. You know, our bodies are old. They are wearing out. Joints need to be replaced. It sometimes is not pleasant. And sometimes I look around and think, wow, you know, I see that lady in her 70s and she's bopping around doing everything. Going helping people, this and that. I want to do that. When we take our eyes off Jesus and what and we look at what other people are doing and their abilities, we lose the message. That's when we re really need to go back to scriptures and know that Jesus is our safety net. He is our rock of ages. And why not me? The Lord has a purpose for each and every one of us. And maybe down the road, I can encourage others that are going to be facing these surgeries and help them get through their um, suffering, their questions, and help them. And I think we really need to focus on Jesus more. 
I think sometimes we lose it because we're so wrapped up in our pain and our hurt, our finances or whatever. And, you know, some of those things may be our own faults. Some of them are not. But whatever it is, we have to ask the Jesus for help, for understanding, for courage, for faith, for trust. That's when we'll make it through. And in the end here, welcome, my dear faithful servant, and I'm to your reward. And that's what I try to focus on. And I thought, you know, I need to be on. You know, I take my pain med. I get that window where I'm feeling really like, okay, this is good. And take, take advantage of that opportunity. And um, there are days to where it doesn't work quite so well. But there are several days where maybe it will. So I love each and every one of you. I hope you are enjoying this study as much as I am. I hope you are growing because of it in your faith and your trust in the Lord. That you're, you keep that light that's on the path. You know, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And know that God loves you. And whatever you're going through, he is there. He will comfort you. Seek out his word daily. All right, everyone, you have a blessed day in the Lord. Today is Saturday, March 2nd. Time is just going by so fast. I know we have several doctor's appointments and x-rays to take and MRIs, and the next two months are going to be pretty packed for us, me getting ready for surgery, my husband getting ready for his mouth surgery. We go next Thursday to another dentist. We found out, we went to one dentist, and he wanted to charge us like $7,600 to get two post put on for his dentures to clip over because Ron's got bones showing down here now. He can't eat properly. It's been going on for months. Well, I got a second opinion and it's only going to be like $5,500 or $5,200. We're going to save like $2,500. So it always pays to get a second opinion. And we just have a lot going on in the past couple months, the past two months. But you know what? My husband last night said, you know, it's a little bit overwhelming, isn't it? I said, yeah, if we let it, if we let it be overwhelming, but I've got everything written on the calendar. What's going to happen when we always look at the calendar the night, night before we go to bed? Okay, what's on tomorrow's agenda? Then, okay, that's what we're going on tomorrow. And then kind of check that week and kind of make a note. Okay, like this coming week, Ron's got to, um, on Thursday, he's going to go see that dentist. And that's pretty much what we have going on this week. And, um, you know, and then we'll go from there. And if we keep everything in, in its box, not God. Don't keep God in a box. God cannot be contained in a box. But, you know, if you keep everything in its little time box of when it's going to happen, your life will be much run much smoother. You won't be worrying about things on down the road that may not ever happen. And you will be more at peace with yourself and with God. All right, take care. You have a blessed day, Lord willing. I'll be back on tomorrow, and we'll be reading some more chapters. I didn't quite get the last couple I wanted to get done, but I think when we come on, we'll do 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. You know what? We may just we may wind this up tomorrow. For sure, by Monday, we will have finished this book. I know someday I will want to go through this series again. I think there's a lot more that we can learn going through it a second time. It won't be anytime soon. There's other studies that I'm lining up for us that are very powerful. Um, I did find another book. I've been browsing through my books, and it's so hard to choose. I know. I say, we're going to do this one, that one. This is They Walked with God, 40 Bible Characters Who Inspired Us. And um, it looks pretty good. I think on Monday, I'll go over what this is. I, I want us to choose. I know, um, you know, after we get done with this book, like I say, there's God is my hiding place. And we got marching orders for the end of time. I stand and knock at the door. Corey has written a lot of books. Bless her heart. 
She has left her wisdom behind for us to learn from and to grow. And right now, we're going to continue and keep being fed by the wisdom of Corey Ten Boom. All right, you take care. God bless you.